Hello, and welcome to today's live broadcast, linking viral discovery with causality. My name is Victoria Coop, and I'm from Alto Marketing, a specialist life science and healthcare marketing agency. I'll be your moderator for today's event. We are delighted to bring to you this educational web seminar presented by LabRoots and sponsored by Advanced Cell Diagnostics. Advanced Cell Diagnostics, or ACD, is a leader in the field of molecular pathology. Its products and services are based on the company's proprietary RNA scope technology, which is the first automated multiplex, chromogenic, and fluorescent in situ hybridization platform that is capable of detecting and quantifying RNA biomarkers at single molecule sensitivity. You can find out more about ACD and RNA scope at www.acdbio.com. So we have a few important announcements before we begin. This webcast is designed to be interactive and we do encourage you to ask questions during the event. You can submit questions by typing them in the Q&A box which can be found by clicking on the green Q&A button at the lower left of the presentation window. We'll try to answer as many questions as we can, and if we don't answer your question during this presentation, all questions will be answered by email afterwards. You can enlarge the slide window by clicking on the screen icon in the lower right-hand corner of the slide window. If you do have any technical problems viewing or hearing this presentation, please click on the support button at the top right of your presentation window or submit your problem to the green Q&A button on the lower left. Okay, so I would now like to introduce today's speaker, Dr. Patricia Pepevento, who is a professor in the Department of Pathology, Microbiology and Immunology at the School of Veterinary Medicine at UC Davis. She received her PhD from Harvard and her DVM from the School of Veterinary Medicine at UC Davis, where she continued her residency training and has been on faculty since 2008. Dr. Petrovento's research interests are focused on the identification and characterization of infectious diseases arising from intensively housed animals or animals at the human-animal interface. She's going to speak to us today about how her group has discovered novel viruses in animal species and the link these viruses may have with disease causality. So I will now turn over to Dr. Pesavento for her presentation. Hi everyone, this is uh, Patricia Pesavento and I'm speaking with you from the School of Veterinary Medicine at UC Davis. Uh, welcome to my office. Um, as a veterinarian and a research pathologist, uh, we have the unique opportunity to investigate the natural history of viral disease. And we're really focused here on comparative medicine, whether it's between humans and animals or among mammalian species, uh, because we feel like it can enlighten us and enlighten you about viral potential and mapping viruses to diseases, um, and also the range of host reactions um, that can be, uh, that can happen um, relative to a disease. So we have a very strong One Health program here at Davis um, with a medical school and um, the veterinary school and animal sciences. And um, our, our focus on viral discovery, at least in my lab, is in part to extend our knowledge of the phylogeny of viruses, but it's very, very exciting for us, especially to be able to distinguish um, between viruses that pers persist very quietly or innocu innocuously in our bodies over our lifetimes from those that are really dangerous. And what I'd like to focus on today is given the very strong history of viral discovery and the ever increasing capability we have for discovering viruses, how do we then um, ensure ourselves that those viruses are important in the, ca in the case of disease? So, just to extend the, um, the introduction that um, Victoria has so graciously done, and also um, to thank um, ACD for inviting me um, and LabRoots for inviting me to do this, I want to explain uh, what I do. I think it's a um, relatively unique position where um, I'm in a hospital that has many, many cases of, um, uh, of animal, individual animal uh, problems, but we also do herd health 
uh, care and aquarium and zoo. Um, and um, we have a strong clinical trials program as well. The teaching portion of my job is veterinary school all the way to 4-H clubs and high schools in the area. Um, and the last part and the part that I'll be focusing on today is the research. And I come from a background that's cell biology um, and became a pathologist. And I'm very new to, um, uh, to uh, becoming a, a real a virologist. I'm sort of a pseudo virologist. Um, so um, I'm really excited about being able to um, bring this into, uh, into uh, uh, this seminar. So animal disease surveillance in California isn't uh, a whole lot different than surveillance in other states, although it tends to be state, associate, um, state associated. They do share the, the priority that um, the surveillance is really there um, is, and especially subsidized to cover zoonoses, that is uh, diseases that can affect humans. And so we have strong programs that are able to um, identify whether or not there's rabies or influenza or other zoonotic diseases. Um, California has a, a really wonderful system of laboratories throughout the state um, that are the food safety uh, and animal uh, safety laboratories. And they're a very, very strong uh, part of our animal health um, network here in California. And among uh, our vet school and these um, labs um, that we have across California, we do a number of uh, different necropsies surveillance, which I think is more is unique compared to human medicine, um, where autopsies or necropsies are, are more unusual. So this is a big part of our sampling pool um, for how we uh, track viruses and um, path pathogens and infectious diseases. So to quickly get to uh, the strength um, of, of what our system is, as a pathologist, we receive cases and we estimate what diseases those animals have um, based on the histology of those tissues. And this is a big part of um, my job. And uh, we had an enormous number of cases that were enigmatic. When I first came on as faculty here, we still have always have an enormous number of cases where we can't exactly estimate etiology. And um, I collaborated very early in my, uh, in my uh, faculty career here with uh, Dr. Delwart from UCSF, who is an expert in um, viral discovery. And we have collaboratively uh, found a number of different viruses in, um, in animals, um, novel viruses or viruses that hadn't previously been recognized. And we're in the business of making sure that the viruses that we find actually link back to the diseases that, um, that I saw basically in the first place in, um, in those in the, um, in the original histology. So none of you should be surprised at all that um, we're able to find viruses. Um, given the techniques that we have today, um, there's an enormous capacity to discover viruses. And especially through novel methods of deep sequencing, um, there are a number of labs and a number of uh, releases of new viruses. And in this paper that's now uh, just a few years old, a group of researchers at Columbia University um, chose a single species, um, which was uh, um, the Indian flying fox, pictured up in the right top corner of the slide here, and, um, and um, did a very high coverage sequencing uh, method to uh, count and to describe um, and estimate all of the viruses in this single species. And by extrapolation in that paper, what they did is they tried to es estimate or um, extrapolate to all mammals and estimated that we have about 320,000 viruses out there waiting to be discovered. Which, which pretty much means that if you pick up any animal or any uh, tissue from an animal, perhaps um, you have the chance of uh, discovering your own virus. And I think really um, that's nearly true these days and almost, uh, and almost financially feasible actually at this point. Um, but the really important thing um, is to be able to say that virus that you discovered is important to the health of that species. And, um, and that's what we're gonna be talking about. So the fact that we can uh, find so many viruses um, might be able to very, very importantly identify what's causing the disease and identifying the virus and mapping it to the lesion will really help uh, inform us about how we could treat or how well those animals or um, individual animal is going to do. I wanna briefly diverge to talk about another repercussion 
that I think is very, very important about um, uh, our ability to identify viruses and bacteria so much um, more uh, efficiently these days. And that is that uh, when, when uh, pathogens are symbiotic in their relationship, I think that we don't right now have an easy way to, to uh, identify that. So let me give you a, a study that was done now, um, that was done now uh, uh, over 10 years ago that really blew my mind. One of, them, one of the things that really encouraged me to look more uh, deeply at how to um, uh, understand polymicrobial infections. Pak Pinho and his group um, published in Avian Diseases that when they took a large group of turkeys and um, infected them with 10 to the 10th colony forming units of um, enteropathogenic E. coli alone, that those turkeys showed no clinical signs at all, even with a, with a heavy load of that pathogenic E. coli. By the same token, they could infect the turkeys with turkey coronavirus, and the turkey coronavirus, even though it would persist in the turkeys, caused no disease in those animals. But if you give a turkey coronavirus um, uh, at, at day zero, let's say in their timeline, and then at any time subsequent to that, um, and they looked at one to seven days after coronavirus infection, you can fully give those animals 10 to the uh, six logs less, so 10 to the fourth colony forming units of enteropathogenic E. coli. And when you introduce those two pathogens together, half of the flock will uh, die and more than that will be uh, severely ill with that disease. And what this tells you is that coronavirus infection alone, if someone were just studying this arm of the disease, just the coronavirus, they would potentially tell you, no, that's not an important pathogen in turkeys. But we have to be able to identify these two together and recognize the symbiotic relationship that they have and our, our sequencing methods, our deep sequencing, our, all of our new molecular methods, and coupled with the ability to, uh, to map that, disease, that virus with that disease is really a very powerful way to uncover these polymicrobial infections. Really exciting um, stuff. This is just a, a, a graphic um, from Eric Delwart in a, in a review he did on animal virus discovery. And it's just to say that um, the samples that we get can be from, just like in human medicine, can be from a whole number of different places. And people that are involved with animal health from any of those regions are, have the ability to identify an illness, whether it's in an individual animal or it's in a, an outbreak of animals. And um, let me go back just for a minute. And from that, uh, um, and from that um, uh, identification, they could move into a variety of methods that will review in order to characterize a virus or a pathogen, and I'm, I'm focusing on viruses, but a, a pathogen in that animal. So the different mechanisms of viral discovery right now are very exciting, and the reason why we have so many new viruses in our world Traditional virologists would often take a piece of tissue that was an affected piece of tissue and put it in cell culture and ask for whether or not there were morphologic changes or cell lysis in that culture. And using that fresh sample then, if that virus was cytolytic or if that virus caused cell changes, be able to recognize the virus in that cell culture. The limitations to that, the power in that is very strong. The limitations to that are obvious, which is that many viruses, most viruses, don't cause morphologic changes in cell culture. And so we can look at viruses in a very nicely, um, uh, very nice section by electron microscopy. These other mechanisms of uh, viral discovery are less, um, are, uh, require less knowledge about the tissue in the first place. In other words, we can do microarrays, degenerate PCR, and deep sequencing by just retrieving the nucleic acids from even a formalin fixed paraffin embedded um, section. The microarray and the degenerate PCR strategies definitely require, and that's why these are starred here, definitely require some a priori knowledge of the sequences of the virus. But depending on how deep a deep sequencing technique is, this particular method, metagenomic method of discovering viruses is less biased. 
You basically don't really have to know what virus is in there in order to ask that question. So these are very powerful ways, and many people couple these ways and do more than one when they're working. So this, this uh, particular focus on finding viruses is, um, has been really very powerful and has been growing um, quite rapidly. What I want to spend the rest of the time I'm here talking about is our ability to associate the viruses that we find with disease um, or our ability um, to um, uh, um, and not, you know, find, figure out which of uh, uh, tissues and things are being, uh, are, are the virus is living in. And this is really much trickier. And I think that this is the real, the real front uh, and excitement and um, novel uh, thing in viral discovery is your ability to associate that with a disease. The power that's in this is really remarkable. So disease association, again, we have some more tradition, traditional virological methods um, here, like electron microscopy, um, and then we have some that are more, um, that are, have, uh, are new or um, there are new uh, um, uh, methods and more sensitive methods that are being developed, one of which we're going to talk about today. In particular, I'll be focusing on in situ hybridization. And I want to make sure you understand why my lab is focused on in situ hybridization. We're very fond of electron microscopy. We're pathologists. We love morphology. Um, that specimen has to be really perfect, and the virus has to be quite abundant to be there. And in terms of PCR and serology, and I'll move to the strengths and limitations of these other of these systems that I've just listed. Um, in terms of serology, you really need to prospectively find blood from the affected animals and then also have the pathogen or a protein expressed from that pathogen in order to ask the question about whether or not an animal has been exposed. And exposure doesn't necessarily show significance, but these epidemiologic studies are very powerful in showing the importance of a pathogen. PCR, intensely sensitive, and lots and lots of studies on viruses and tissues um, can, demonstrate, uh, can demonstrate the association. But when we take a piece of skin, for example, and grind it up, and then asked by PCR, we really are unable in that, in that assay, in a PCR-based molecular assay, to know which cell is a target and also whether or not that is either a contaminant, for example, of the skin surface or actually is present in the tissue. And immunohistochemistry, which can map a, a, a pathogen to a tissue, is a very strong technique, but generating an antibody is not a trivial thing. So I said I was going to focus on in situ hybridization, and I will with two examples um, from here on out. What you need to start with with in situ hybridization is what we already have in hand from our viral discovery, which is the sequence of the pathogen. So given the sequence of the pathogen and the tissue, whether it's embedded fresh um, uh, or a fresh frozen example or a embedded paraffin example, in situ hybridization is a very, very effective way of mapping a disease to um, to, uh, um, with causality. So my first example then is um, one um, that uh, presented to us as a single uh, crossbred steer, um, and um, that was one with neurologic disease. These are of great concern to us, as you can imagine. Things that we have to rule out in the diagnostic lab would be mad cow disease would be a really important one, rabies another important one, listeria an important zoonotic pathogen. And so our neurologic uh, cattle are ones we pay great attention to, both in our food chain and in our individual animal health. And um, we had a cow that um, came to us um, with, uh, with um, neurologic signs, and um, we were able to very, very quickly rule out all of the pathogens and potential etiologies that you can see listed on your slide right now by a variety of different assays. Where, where that left us was with um, what we diagnosed this cow with was an inflammatory encephalitis of unknown origin that was likely to be viral. Now, we don't want to be stuck there, and so we immediately moved into our metagenomics deep sequencing scheme and were able to identify from brain tissue from this affected steer an astrovirus. Um, that was um, very, very similar to um, other members of the family, which are um, highly divergent of the mastovirus family. 
And, um, and we were able to take this virus and our immediate questions were, I think what you um, would know are very obvious, which is that astroviruses are present in a whole wide variety of mammals and birds and other animals. There are hundreds of thousands of them that have been described. And most of them, um, the large majority of them are associated with um, enteric disease. So we were left with knowing that we had a cow that was neurologic tissue from which we were able to derive an astrovirus, but not knowing whether or not that usually enteric astrovirus was um, associated with neurologic disease in this cow. So we, um, doing a phylogenetic analysis was able to give us some clues, and we were very surprised that our bovine astrovirus, which is red dotted here, no matter whether we, what, what of the uh, portions of the genome we analyzed, mapped very close to a cluster or clustered very close to human astroviruses that had been identified in neurologic disease, as well as a mink astrovirus that had been identified in, in cases of neurologic disease. So we were very excited by that. And what we did is we moved immediately then um, into a retrospective survey where we took 32 cases of um, bovine encephalitis where we hadn't figured out an etiology and um, we took the tissue from those, and we first did PCR on that series, and we're only able to identify two other cases where we could amplify bovine um, astrovirus, neural S1, and moved there immediately into in situ hybridization. And I'm gonna tell you the punchline right here is that we were able to, um, the punchline is that that PCR amplification strategy missed um, a half a dozen um, of the cases that were also in this 32 case uh, retrospective because the in situ hybridization that we did um, using the RNA scope was more sensitive. And I thought that was a really remarkable and powerful way um, to demonstrate the, the um, using combined methods of discovery. So let me go into what we, um, what exactly um, we did. Because I was new to um, in situ hybridization, I um, used two different strategies for this uh, study. I designed an oligomer probe that was directly labeled. It was a 28 mer probe um, and recognized um, the open reading frame of, um, of uh, bovine astrovirus. And, and I'll point out that um, this, this method, this in situ hybridization method is actually able to, um, is actually able to um, map two, um, two different, for example, uh, if we had two different species of RNA and we wanted to identify cell type, for now what we wanted to know is whether or not the virus was in certain cells. But the power of the probe was gonna go beyond that and did go beyond that in our studies. And so um, we, uh, we designed um, uh, uh, an RNA scope to compare the oligomer to and I'll briefly talk about this technology. Um, this is a relatively new uh, novel technology and has an innovative departure from traditional um, oligomer um, in situ hybridization, even full labeled vi viral in situ hybridization, which I've done on several occasions, but has some, um, or has had in my hand some background problems. And the technology in brief is to take about a kilobase region of the virus, and it doesn't have to be contiguous and design uh, 20 probe pairs, and this is really vital, 20 probe pairs that sit next to each other across that um, region, that target of the genome. And by a signal amplification cascade, um, you, will get a, uh, you will get an amplification of your, uh, of your uh, viral sequence if and only if a pair of adjacent probes hybridize. So the techniques becomes very sensitive and very specific at the same time because three probe pairs have to hybridize together in order to see the quantitative um, uh, deposit of the chromogen um, in that, uh, on that slide. And so um, we have, since this time, used RNA scope-ish on um, eight viral projects, um, um, all of them uh, successful. And um, this is a non-radioisotope um, uh, method that's um, uh, semi-quantitative for viral load, which is also extremely helpful in causality. And so that's a, that I, wanna, I wanna show you why I'm focusing on RNA scope from the advanced cell diagnostics. And that is that um, I compared them directly in two cases. The one here is the bovine astrovirus that I'll show you. And that by that method, we did see scattered neurons that had some labeled probe. And I'll compare that now to the RNA scope in the same slide, actually. 
So what you can see on this um, slide in the region of the brainstem of the cow is that a number of different neurons are um, visible here. Some of them visible with some gray spot or dust in them, which is our hybridization. It is a believable hybridization, and it does tell us that the neurons are the target. But wasn't, um, but was much more exciting for us to look at the same region um, by RNA scope and identify not just the target neurons and uh, another about 70% of neurons that we hadn't identified with an oligomer, but also the fact that the that the virus was present within the extensions, the axons, um, and the dendrites of the neurons as well. So we could really, um, in this way, and I'll show you a region, the cerebellum to our eye as a pathologist was unaffected. There were some neurons that were, were equivocally, uh, were equivocally um, undergoing necrosis, but as you can see, really very little um, inflammation associated with this. And if we use the, um, uh, the in situ hybridization method, not only are we seeing many of these cells um, affected, but we see the extension into the molecular layer of their dendritic processes, which was really exciting for me as a morphologist. Um, and it helps give us an idea. Oh, last is this is a ganglion um, as well. The cow was ataxic. We were really interested in the spinal cord, which is affected. And what you see in this picture, there are a few neurons here that are undergoing um, necrosis. And those neurons are full of virus um, with very, very little background in unaffected neurons, um, as in this case. So really convincing and um, enables us to do um, a multiple of very powerful things. For one, we could, we could map that disease. We could with great confidence say that this virus is in the correct cells to map to the clinical presentation of this animal and to be causative for this particular encephalitis. That was really the most important thing um, that happened in this study. But above and beyond that, as we progress with our understanding of this disease, um, is that we could map the actual distribution of the lesions because of the sensitive method of it, and we could also be able to make some uh, headway into the pathogenesis, specifically how that virus um, gets into the brain and um, how it causes neuronal necrosis. Very, very exciting um, uh, work. Um, so I'm going to move to our next um, uh, our next example that I uh, will talk about here and introduce that by saying that viral oncogenesis is extremely important in uh, human medicine as and um, is becoming um, as we're understanding it more um, effectively is becoming very important in veterinary medicine as well. So fully 16 to 20 percent, depending on um, who you quote, um, of human cancers. Um, can be attributed to either a, a bacteria or a viral pathogen. So they're a very important, uh, they're a very important impact on, on the global view, of, uh, the global burden of cancer in our human population. And a lot of these have been studied for a very long time. Cancer in domestic and free-ranging animals much less is known about, about cancer in our free-ranging animals. And we really have no clue at all which pathogens are contributing to cancer if they are. But I'd like to point out from a sort of a One Health perspective and a veterinarian point of view that we're creating, humans are creating really rapidly changing interfaces between animals and humans. And um, for example, um, in, um, in our, uh, we're, we, we have very intensive housing of animals in our agriculture. If you look at the history of the planet, agriculture and um, dairies and things like where we're, where we're our sh animal shelters, like um, small animal shelters, very, very, very new in our world, extremely new in our world. And we're creating those. As well, because of our population increases, um, the interface between humans and animals is quite intense, and our relationship with animals has been changing over time um, and is really um, pretty remarkably intimate. And so we have these populations of pets where we've created uh, uh, immune diversity um, and immune bottlenecking, if you will. And then by our um, imposition on the environment, we've also created wildlife species that have very, very low diversity and susceptibility or immunosuppression and might be more susceptible to viruses um, than they were previously. So 
Cancer and wildlife, if you had asked me, honestly, if you had asked me um, uh, 10 years ago even whether or not cancer was a really important uh, cause of uh, death in our wildlife populations, I would probably have said not so much. And the reason I'd, I would say that is because they face so many other very difficult things. It's very hard to be a wild animal. Um, but I do think that, um, that um, within the last um, about five years, uh, what we're seeing and what we've recognized is that there are at least eight species now that are threatened to endangerment, that are threatened to extinction because of cancer. And, and that's a real new phenomenon. And so we're really needing to pay more attention to, this, to the virome and the changing face of um, our wildlife uh, and humans um, together. So let me talk about this really interesting story um, that we're working on. Um, it's about the relationship of a polyoma virus with brain tumors in raccoons. And polyoma virus is, um, used to be actually in the same family as papilloma virus, so the cause of cervical cancer, um, and now has been split off obviously into, into its own uh, place. Um, and um, these are uh, known to be associated, or there, is a, um, there are species of polyoma virus that are known to be associated with cancer in humans, and we'll talk a little bit about that as well. So here we are in Davis, pretty much central in California, and like anywhere else um, that has suburbia, we have a, a good deal of um, raccoons that live in intimate association with us. They, uh, they share our, our homes um, and our yards. They eat uh, the same food we do just a, a little bit later. Um, and so we're really um, very, uh, very much uh, involved. They're very, very much around us. They're very, very successful, as a matter of fact. If you take in suburbia the equivalent of a city block, the number of raccoons that can live in that region, and that's because they're supported by our, our waste and et cetera, um, is about 55. Um, you won't always see them, but they're there and, and really quite successful and not endangered. The raccoons share that interface that region with a lot of other what I'll call mesopredators, um, so um, mid-sized animals, including foxes, opossums, and skunks, our dogs and cats, for sure, um, um, and here in California also badgers and some other, um, and definitely quite a few rodent species. And we have a very unique opportunity at UC Davis to be involved um, and to be in communication with wildlife rescue uh, services in, um, in uh, the Bay Area that have been very, very on it, very, very um, um, uh, tuned in to any uh, diseases that are coming through the wildlife population. And we have the Fish and Wildlife Services here also extremely vigilant about changes. And they are the ones who recognized that raccoons were coming in with diseases, uh, with a disease different than they had recognized before. So what they saw was neurologic disease that wasn't distemper, which is our typical thing. And, um, and they brought those raccoons into the diagnostic lab here and into the BMTH and said, what's going on? And um, in now, um, to get to the punchline, in about 200 raccoons that we have necropsied in the last few years, fully 12% of those um, raccoons um, have had a brain tumor in the exact same location of their brain in the olfactory tract. And that's remarkable. Raccoons live about two or three years in the wild, and tumors are very, very unusual in raccoons. And here we're seeing 12% of the population not just present with cancer, but present with the same cancer. So we found that we found that really intriguing. Um, this happened um, in a short period of time because we could look at the hundreds of uh, raccoons we had necropsy before that time and know that there was no uh, brain cancer before that time. And moreover, we could ask across the nation, hey, have any of you veterinary pathologists seen brain tumors in raccoons? And um, at least by word of mouth, we, they hadn't seen them. And so this was a relatively geographically isolated incident as well. So really persuaded us to move on and use a degenerate primer strategy to ask um, what we started with, which was whether or not a herpes virus or a polyoma virus was associated with that cancer. And oncogenic viruses, which many of which are listed here, really share the, um, the, the, uh, the characteristic that they're persistent viruses in animals, sometimes lasting over your entire lifetime. And it makes it very, very tricky to know if we find one of these viruses, whether or not it's actually causal for the cancer. 
So we did find a virus in the tumor tissue of the raccoon that we dubbed raccoon polyoma virus. It looks very much like SV40, which is the canonical um, virus of this family. And that virus was associated with absolute, has been associated with 100% of the neuroglial tumors, which is 20 at this um, time um, that we saw. And there was a high copy number. So that's a really enormous number. They remain to, just on the West Coast, and they're all within this exact same anatomic location that you can see here. Really interesting story. So Dr. Molly Church um, wanted to ask our first question, question was, is it the case that this virus is only on the West Coast? And um, the results that she had from creating this lovely ELISA that was able uh, for us um, to identify exposure to raccoon polyomavirus is that like human polyomaviruses, rac polyomavirus is all over um, the United States. So she got serologic collections from a number of different states and showed that the um, exposure was anywhere from 5% to 70%. Very high in California and in Washington, the exposure rate, and lower in some states, but we also had East Coast states with high exposure. Um, so it wasn't just the case that the virus was in the West Coast. So the question that we were left with was whether or not raccoon polyomavirus was causing the brain tumor or whether it was just incidentally there and a persistent virus. So um, one of the things we looked at very quickly was um, whether or not the oncogenic protein for polyomavirus, which is the T antigen, was actually there in the tumors. And we did this two different ways. The first way I'm showing you here, which is by transcriptome analysis, that the T antigen was, a high, in high, was in high copy number in those viruses, and that the structural proteins of that virus were in very low copy, no, copy number in that virus. And what that told us was that there was active um, transcription, but we had no idea whether or not it was in the tumor cells or whether it was in the surrounding tissue. So the next thing that we did then was to look at um, the uh, tumors directly to ask whether or not the viral transcript for large T antigen, remember that's the oncogenic protein or the oncogen, that's the transcript for the oncogenic protein, the protein that we know is transformative, um, was in the tumor. And here's the, um, the hematoxylin and eosin stain of one of the tumors in the raccoon, cross section of the tumor, and this is the tumor in the frontal lobes of that raccoon where it exists. And when we used RNA scope ish um, for RAC PYV, um, then we saw that at least 50% of the population and um, up to 100% of the population was positive um, for LT, or the presence of that transcript was uh, detectable and in high copy number within that tumor. This is another case where I used a, an oligo probe, and in that case, we actually were unable to detect the virus um, within the tumor. So another very persuasive um, uh, a bid for using a sensitive and specific um, longer probe for your ish technique, especially one with this amplification capability. We made a xenotransplant model of this tumor by taking a primary cell culture, um, and this is um, Kevin Willard and Molly Church. Kevin Willard is a neuropathologist who is a collaborator of mine, and um, he and Terza Brostoff and Molly Church created this xenotransplant model, which um, successfully uh, re, uh, re recapitulated the tumor within the mouse. And what we saw again by um, in situ um, hybridization by the RNA scope method was that that tumor in the mouse was very similar to the one that we were seeing in the raccoon. We have tissue culture as well, or we have cells um, that have been cultured out of the primary and the secondary tumors or the xenotransplant tumors. And we're looking forward to doing uh, tissue culture RNA in situ as well to ask about the, um, the expression uh, within, within, those, um, tum within those cells. I want to show you another very uh, persuasive picture vis-a-vis -vis causality. Um, uh, uh, this, this animal had, um, the animal that you're looking at here, you're looking at the liver of an animal where that brain tumor was metastatic. And so the normal liver tissue is up here and, um, hyper and eosinophilic or pink in the top of the slide. And the tumor is the round outlined lower right or corner right um, population. 
And again, by the um, RNA scope method, um, the mothership tumor or the brain tumor had 50% of the cells expressing the oncogenic protein large T antigen. And in the case of the metastases that were in the liver, the adrenal gland, and the lung of this animal, 100% of those cells um, had this um, oncogenic protein, oncogenic uh, transcript within their nuclei. Again, very, very um, important to us in terms of proving that this particular virus is causal or necessary for the propagation of that tumor. So another thing that Dr. Church worked on is, um, and this was one of the most exciting parts that we're really um, focusing on right now, is that that virus was not only present in high copy number in the tumor, but animals that had the tumor and animals that didn't have the tumor had other tissues with a lower copy number by PCR of the virus. So that included the kidney, um, the intestinal tract, bone marrow, salivary gland, a number of different tissues. Very common in polyomaviruses, not something that we were surprised at, but very difficult to study because the copy number reflects the fact that raccoon polyomavirus is persistent and only present in a few cells, like one here and one there, um, and hasn't been studied very well at all in human medicine because it's difficult to obtain the tissues to study that. And so I will leave you all with um, the very interesting result that when we looked in the kidneys of these animals um, and we saw some damage to kidney tubules, so you're looking at the cortex of a kidney of a raccoon that was shedding this virus. And these are renal tubules that you'll see in cross-section here. And one of those tubules in the center is undergoing, undergoing necrosis or um, undergo, um, the cells are actually lysing and sloughing off into the center of the tubule. And you can see that by this karyorectic debris that's in the center. And in a serial uh, section of this exact same um, part uh, slide, what you can see again by the um, by ish uh, method is that individual cell nuclei within that tubule are, can, are contain that polyomavirus and that's absent from the unaffected tissue surrounding it. And it was very remarkable to me that I could map the, the, the minor damage within the kidney in this normal animal that didn't have any you know, overt clinical kidney disease, that I could map a slowly degenerative process in that animal. So really very exciting. We're in a place now with, um, um, because of the proof of causality, we're in a place now where we can take the cells that we know are the targets of infection um, through the ISH studies, and we can actually uh, grow those cells and now look to um, and infect those cells and study infection of those cells and try to understand whether or not, when, we, when we're producing virus, try to understand the difference between this virus getting into a stem cell in the brain and causing a tumor versus getting into a kidney and just very insidiously causing minor damage to that kidney and lasting for the lifetime of the animal. So we're very, very excited about where these are going. And I think I'll leave that um, with questions and, um, and um, back to uh, our, our, host, our hosts and um, see if any of you all have um, uh, anything that you want to add. Oh, I think you all have um, uh, anything that you want to Well, thank you very much, Patty, for that uh, really, really interesting presentation. Um, we are going to go on to questions in just a minute, but I just wanted to uh, let you know that in a minute or two, we're going to be uh, sending out a couple of polls which would be really great if you guys could uh, participate in just a couple of yes no. Uh, questions and answers. Um, so just before we do get started on the question and answer session, I would like to remind you guys how to submit questions. So you can submit questions by typing them in the Q&A box, which can be found by clicking on the green Q&A button at the lower left of the presentation window. And once again, we will try to answer as many questions as we can. And if we don't get around to doing it here and now, you will be emailed afterwards um, and get those answered for you. So, so it is worth uh, putting in your questions. Uh, we, will, we will answer them all. Okay. Uh, so I'll just give time for those uh, polls a second and give you guys time for any questions. 
Okay. So, uh, first question then, Paddy. Um, you show some examples of uh, sequential hematoxamine and in situ hybridization. Did you try to combine both methods on the same slide? So, uh, hey, thank you, Victoria, for that question. So, absolutely, um, so we have used um, the RNA scope primarily at this point for detecting virus just in tissues. But um, our lab is really looking forward to doing double methods on the same slide. Certainly, counterstain with hematoxylin um, and, and um, eosin is very possible on the same slide. So the technology remarkably preserves the tissue integrity, even to, the, to a cell level. I've never had any trouble identifying um, um, cell type to the, to the, to the um, degree that I can do it, for example, with H&E um, on a regular slide. In addition to that, there is the possibility of combining immunohistochemistry technique with in situ techniques in order um, to specifically identify this target cell of infection. And I see I can actually, there's another uh, question uh, that's come up on this question and answer session from uh, Omar Vieira that says, did you see any other virus such as CDV or canine distemper virus in raccoons affected by polyoma virus? And that's a really good question. Omar is um, insightful in that he recognizes, I think, that um, usually polyoma viruses, when they are oncogenic, are affecting people um, that are immunosuppressed. And canine distemper virus is highly immunosuppressive and endemic in our um, raccoon population. I can only tell you, Omar, that, um, that these animals were probably exposed to canine distemper, or were exposed to canine distemper virus. That is entirely possible. But we, we, they didn't have any active canine distemper virus at the time that they had the tumor. In other words, we couldn't see any canine distemper virus at all. Um, uh, we couldn't see any canine distemper virus at all within the brain at that time. That doesn't mean that they didn't have it when they were younger and get over it and have some bout of immunosuppression. But as far as we could tell, these animals were replete in terms of their T cell population, B cell population, and did not appear histologically to be immunosuppressed. There's another question that I see up here, Victoria, um, that, um, that's tagged. It says, do you think that RNA scope could lead to accurate identification of diseases with less material? For instance, and I don't see anything after, hold on. I don't see anything after for instance, but with less material, absolutely. Um, there are a number of different publications that look at RNA scope in individual cells, for example, in sputum, like individual single cells. Um, cytology is possible. As an as a, as a, um, anatomic pathologist, I always uh, go for more tissue. As you know, we always ask for as much as we can look at. But um, we've done needle biopsies. We've done very tiny biopsies as well. Uh, third question here um, says, does RAC Paul y um, polyomavirus infect other animals? Ah, so um, we know that the host for raccoon polyomavirus, based on Molly's uh, serologic studies, is the raccoon. In other words, we know that they can be infected and viremic. We don't know whether or not it's possible that this virus recently jumped from another animal or is present in other animals. And that's a question, it's a really insightful question because it's something we're very interested in looking for. We'll probably tackle that by asking whether or not animals have been exposed and then moving on to identifying the virus in those tissues. I have a question here from uh, Roger Rennie. Um, uh, from Toxpath Consulting, and Roger asks, are there CNS signs of raccoon polyomavirus infection distinct from other viral diseases? Well, so our N equals 20 on this, Roger, and um, again, the reason that these very, very astute um, uh, uh, wildlife biologists and um, rehabbers were able to identify this, this um, uh, raccoon polyomavirus was, or the, the tumors anyway, was that they had raccoons in that were not systemically ill. Viral diseases usually cause fever, and in the case of distemper virus, a uh, uh, runny nose, and, and, um, and uh, lethargy, et cetera. The raccoons that were coming in were older, docile, walking around in circles, and you could pick them up, and that is not common for a raccoon. Raccoons usually, um, raccoons usually uh, will want to kill you if they're normal and in good shape. 
And um, these raccoons were really very unaware of what was going on around them. And most of them progressed to being comatose very quickly after being um, picked up by these rehab facilities. I will state, because um, it's very important to make the clarification, that the population of raccoons that we look at as anatomic pathologists is a very perverted one. Any raccoon that's picked up by, um, that's, um, picked up by pu the, pu the public or by rehabbers is by definition going to be sick or neurologic. And so we've already skewed our population very severely um, by looking at those um, that we do. Okay, um, does RNA scope work on paraffinase sessions? Absolutely. In fact, it, it, it requires um, the RNA scope work that I'm doing with the DAB method um, works on embedded paraffin uh, sections. And um, that's what all the pictures that you saw were on paraffin embedded, wax embedded tissue. I've done blocks back now 20 years um, without any problem at all um, or, in, or loss of integrity of the signal um, for viruses. Um, Gary. El Sasser from Fugo says, I've been tracking SV40, JC, um, BK, and especially CMV around human cancers. And it says, you mentioned that polyomavirus being similar to, I cannot see the rest of this. Um, so I'm going to ask um, full question on white blocks below. Oh, got you. Thank you, Don. <laughs> Have you come across other viruses in animal leading to tumors, particularly brain tumors? So not brain tumors, Gary, but papillomaviruses um, is undergoing a great epiphany in uh, veterinary medicine. Um, some of the work that I didn't show you today demonstrates um, uh, equine papillomavirus associated with genital tumors in horses. Um, and also um, uh, there are people that are working on papillomavirus in dogs and in um, and fibropapillomas in, uh, in cows as well and horses. So, um, so yes, we're starting to look at other types. Um, there's a, uh, a, um, a question here from Utrecht University from Grün. Um, what is the detection limit of RNA scope? So the published detection limit of RNA scope, um, and the company has um, advanced cell diagnostics has done a good amount of work on this, um, is even up to a single virus in a cell. I think that that's going to um, I think that that's going to depend a little bit on um, on expression and probe and um, it's um, the RNA expression or the mRNA expression how the virus is replicated etc. The examples I gave you today were one was an RNA virus a single stranded positive sense RNA virus which was bovine astrovirus and of course the probe that we chose complemented the probe that we chose in that case complemented the genome. And the second example I gave you, which is the polyomavirus, is a double-stranded DNA virus. And in that case, we were looking at both genome and messenger RNA. So understand that they're compared to mRNA, copies of mRNA of, of, of genes that the host is, the host is um, um, I'm expressing. Looking at viruses, you have to look at it with a little bit of a different uh, view, which is you have to understand whether or not you're looking at viral uh, genome copy number or expression of that genome or both. Um, and um, I've got another question here that asks to discuss the homology level between RACPYV or raccoon polyomavirus and SV40. The polyomaviruses are a really interesting family and like papillomaviruses, they have been uh, evolving and um, living on our bodies since basically since the out of Africa migration of humans, mammals, etc. So the sharing of um, sequence homology overall is about 50% um, at, at the closest with the closest known human polyomavirus, which is Merkel cell polyomavirus. Now, I will say that I've done some work with papillomavirus, and when I used probes to uh, bovine papillomavirus, uh, one, two, and I looked, um, and I looked at uh, a, a wart in a cow that was caused by bovine papillomavirus four, the difference in those sequences was 20%. And um, the RNA scope ish distinguished very clearly between the lesions that were caused by BPV one and two, which are highly homologous, 
um, and BP and lesions that were caused by BPV4, which it didn't recognize without a specific BPV4 probe. So this is a, a very specific way of looking. And obviously, you look at uh, the identity um, from what I um, from what I've been uh, from my understanding. Anytime you fall off uh, sequence identity um, over 10%, you're going to stop seeing um, that um, uh, that hybridization. And I think that we're going to close that, but I do want to say it's been really fun to talk with you all, and all of your, definitely all of your questions um, will be answered um, by email by either me or representatives from ACD if they're technical questions. And I've really enjoyed um, the questions and all the people I've been able to talk to so far. Thank you very much, uh, Patty, for that great presentation, um, really wonderful. Uh, I would also just like to thank quickly our sponsor, Advanced Cell Diagnostics, for making today's educational webcast possible. Just to let you know that today's webcast will be available for on-demand viewing for six months from today's date. You will receive an email from LabRoots alerting you when the webcast is available for replay. And we do invite you to forward that announcement to your colleagues who may have missed today's live event. So it just really means me to thank everybody again for joining us, uh, Dr. P Patricia Presidento, Advanced Cell Diagnostics and LabRoots. Thank you for joining us and see you next time. Goodbye.